Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Kingsway Alliance Church. Um, The psalmist writes, salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. Well, we're here this morning to sing praise to the Lord who brings us salvation. I just want to draw your attention to a couple announcements. If you have your bulletin, you'll see some of them in there. Um, You can read through those. I'm not going to mention everything, but the one I want to especially note is our Missions Emphasis Week that is coming in the end of September, so the dates are listed on there for you to look at, and as you probably know, we do a joint meeting with Akron Alliance, and so this year they're hosting, um, so Friday, you have the listed in your bulletin, but Friday evening, or excuse me, is that, uh, yeah, there's going to be um, Friday evening at 7 p.m. at their church. The, a speaker, Josh, will be speaking. And then on Saturday at 1 p.m., there's a brunch at the Akron Family Restaurant. So I just want to encourage you to take part in that. To, I'll be there with my family, and I would love to see a good representation from our church uh, this year. And then on Sunday, we're going to have a speaker from, um, from South Asia that will be here with us as well. And so Uh, Just a note, they're in a creative access country, so that Sunday we won't be live streaming anything because of safety concerns, so you won't be able to see that on the live stream, so I encourage you to be here in person to be uh, a part of that. So, um, Now, this morning, to all who are weary in need of rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, I don't know about you, but it's been a season of weariness at our church, hasn't it? There's been a lot of mourning, I think, of the Savaggio family and the Martin family and many others who are going through a lot right now. To all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, and to those who are sinners in need of a Savior. This morning, the doors of the church are open with the welcome of the Lord Jesus, who is our ultimate source of rest. He is our ultimate comforter, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, and the friend of sinners. I invite you this morning, would you please join us as we continue worshiping the Lord through song. Would you stand with us, please? Jesus, we love you, we worship. 
worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify
Thank you, oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit to the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Messiah, oh, for sinners slain. Thank you, oh, my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit to the work on earth. Is done. When I stand in glory, I will see his face, and there I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, Holy. your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and At this time, the children can be dismissed for Children's Church, so you can head towards the back. And um, I, out I, of there. <laughs> that's right. They, they were pretty quick, weren't they? Um, and this morning, I, I failed to mention earlier, but we have the privilege of hearing from John speak this morning. So uh, I'm thankful I get to just sit and uh, hear from hear from him and enjoy the the preached word with you guys. So let's pray together as we take our offering. Lord, I thank you so much for uh, just what you've done in our lives, Lord. Uh, you are our Redeemer, and we are so grateful for that. Lord, you have bought us at a, at a precious price, the price of your own Son, Jesus. And so, Lord, as we, as we are here this morning worshiping you, I pray that uh, we would give in our offering out of our generous hearts of thankfulness for what you've done on our behalf. Lord, would you be honored and glorified through this offering, and Lord, may, may none of the giving be done out of duty, but purely out of delight. And it's in your precious name we pray, Lord. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. This morning our scripture reading can be found in Matthew chapter 26. We'll be looking at verses 57 through 66. In the Pew Bible, it's on page 24 in the New Testament section. Those who had seized Jesus 
led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and entered in, and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered, He deserves death. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are so thankful that you've called us to assemble ourselves together this morning for uh, the purpose of worshiping you, Lord. We pray that our worship might be acceptable. We want to see uh, Jesus, Lord. Uh, We've come expecting to hear from you. So, Lord, we pray for our brother John as he brings the word to us that we might see clearly uh, the Lord Jesus and that we might experience uh, even the presence of the Holy Spirit as never before as he would speak to our hearts and minds, that he would uh, penetrate our very being with your word, that we might be better equipped to serve you as we serve one another and those outside the doors of this uh, local assembly. Again, Lord, we just thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. Good to see everybody again. And um, before I get too far into the weeds here, let's, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, thank you so much, Lord, for yourself, and you are everything. We are your creation, and you delight in us in, in ways that we don't understand. And we're grateful that you called us to yourself, and that you love us, and have died for us on the cross, and help us to If we're not already there, help us to get in the right frame of mind to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. Just take anything out of our head that is clouding things or distracting, or if we have any sins that need forgiven, uh, please forgive our sins. If you know, help us to look to you and truly understand what this means. And we just thank you for everything you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Eric, for the introduction. People, I, I don't know if, if you've ever taught or preached or taught a class before, usually when you're preparing, there's a time where you sit down and you look at the text and you, you just have to, and I hope you feel this way, you have to pray and ask the Lord for help because you, you look at this and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I've, I've had those moments as I've been teaching and preaching, and, and, but what you have to do is say, Lord, I'm just going to hold up your word because we can have a lot of like slippery tongued wizards out there that can spin a lie into something that's believable. But the luxury of being a Christian is that we have the written word of God to reference. And this graphic that Matt threw together, I love it. Um, If you can't read it, it says, most of the world since the early church, it's like a sign. Basically it says, welcome, but we don't like you. Right? I mean, that's, and Matt, Matt is so creative and good at these types of things, but The world will tell you, welcome, uh, but we don't like you. And sometimes they don't even say welcome. In in reference to our missionaries, they're in a creative access country, 
you're not even welcome. And again, whenever you read scripture, when you live kind of a sheltered life, like I'll admit that I have as a child, you know, wonderful parents, you know, my father's an elder in the church I grew up in, my mom, you know, raised us and, you know, it was, we always went to church three times a week and they never let me put other things ahead of Jesus. You know, I have no complaints about my childhood. And then living in a time where it was socially cool or okay to be a Christian. And I really think that was kind of just a brief moment in time because when you read scripture, that's not how things are supposed to be in, well, in scripture, correct? When you read the Bible, is there ever a time where Jesus is loved and welcomed outside of the direct saints? So really what we're seeing is kind of a reversion to the mean, to use a, you know, a mathematical term there, but we're, you know, it's not normal for the world to love you and, and be cool with you being a Christian. Now, my heart breaks as I th- see things go away from this, and I don't think we need to celebrate the fact that the world's going to hate you, but we do need to expect it. And that's all part of being a Christian and a follower of, and a child of God. But for, if you've seen me preach before, you know that I like to start off with some sort of current event. And this isn't totally current, it's about four years old. But what was interesting is I was researching, trying to find material to talk about what I wanted to talk about today that I I believe God wants me to to relay. And why the world will reject Jesus. If, If you believe like I do and you know that Jesus is God in the flesh, his word is eternal, it's authoritative, and it's always right. Why doesn't everybody get it? Well, interesting, I, I kind of, like, I try to look for studies, and it's funny because the secular world doesn't always know that they corroborate the Bible. They are, they don't know they're doing it, but they are, especially through science and things like that, but we know and we're told in scripture that the heart of man is what? Is it good? No. We run towards evil. We want to believe what we want to believe. We, we don't want to be shown error because, you know, hey, I'm great. I don't, I, what are you telling me I'm wrong for? And then there's this magical thing called confirmation bias. Anybody know what that is? You have a presupposition or a belief that you hold strongly to, and you tune out things that disagree with you, and you seek out things that agree with you. All throughout the Bible, and especially during Jesus' ministry, how much confirmation bias did he overcome? You know, Lord, you can't do that. Lord, you can't say that. What do you mean? What do you it's, it's all throughout scripture, so none of this should be a surprise. So there was an article I found. Now, this is from, this was printed in the New Yorker. So this is not a bastion of Christian theology here. It was February 19th of 2017, and the author was Elizabeth Colbert. What she did, and the title of the article was, it says, Why Facts Don't Change Our Minds. Now, keep in mind, this is all this earthly vessel that we're talking about here, not, the, not under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So back in 1975, there were a bunch of researchers from Stanford. They invited a group of undergraduates in. These are all like psychology and criminal justice majors. And I'm paraphrasing the article here. They were called in to analyze a group of letters. Some were written by people that actually would would commit suicide, like a suicide note, and others were just fake. And these were all real notes that they pulled because they got it from the coroner's office. So there was a roughly, you know, there's an odd number, but it was pretty close to even. You know, they might, there, 13 of them were fake and 12 were real, or 12 were real, and, or 13 were real and 12 were fake. There were 25 of them, basically. So they were given these notes, and these students were tasked with trying to separate what was real and what was fabricated. It's like that game Balderdash, I think. Anybody ever played that? where you, you create like fake answers to an actual question, and if everybody chooses your fake answer as the right one, you win. And it's a pretty neat game. Anyway, if you ever come across that, it's a lot of fun. But what happened was these students went through, and what they did, this was the real study. It wasn't the students' accuracy at picking what was legitimate or what wasn't. It was their reactions to how they felt about their perceived correctness. Now, let me slow down here. Half of the students were told they got like 24 out of 25 of them right even though they didn't. You know, they, they didn't get their real scores. The other half of the undergraduate students were told that they got like 10 out of 25 right. So what did this do? This framed their thinking about themselves. 
So then this was all revealed to them. Hey, you've been bamboozled, okay? We didn't give you your correct scores. We told you something to gauge your reaction. And this was kind of a double blind study because the real test was after that, they were told to evaluate their own ability and their minds to pick the correct one. And if they felt they were better than the average student at it, well, what do you think happened? The students that were lied to and told that they got like 24 out of 25 rated their own ability as above average and that they were better than the average student at picking the correct note from the fabricated one. The ones that were told they got like 10 out of 25 right, they rated themselves below average and not very good at picking out the correct note. So it had nothing to do with the facts. We don't even know who got the best scores or who picked it, but they were told something. Now, in your Christian walk, do we have an enemy that is a really good liar? We do, don't we? So what, we, what happens is that we begin to frame our worldview based off of lies and deceit. Well, don't we serve an awesome God that number one, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit, but number two, we literally have the instruction manual. You know, like uh, a lot of pastors will say, you know, it, people want to be hit over the head with something like the Apostle Paul. Wouldn't that be easy, right? Well, we have the luxury of every day we can be hit over the head with God's word. And I'm not talking about getting in trouble and having someone throw this at your head. We have the luxury of opening this text up and digging into it on a daily basis. A couple more things, though, and then we're going to really get into this. The conclusion of this study at Stanford was that once formed, impressions are remarkably perseverant. Meaning that your impression about the world, about a certain group of people, about yourself, is almost indelibly inked into there. So if somebody loves a, a sports team and they move to a different state, usually they carry that sports team with them. If somebody was raised to believe a certain thing about a certain group of people, is it easy to get rid of that using the power of man? If you know that you're a sinner, or if you've been raised in horrible circumstances, or have an addiction, or have something terrible that happened to you, is that easy just to take that and set it aside? No, it's called your worldview, and it, it shapes who you are and what you believe. And we're going to get into this, um, but there's just recently, and it, it, I just saw this play out this last week, there is a young man from Mexico, he's a professional boxer, his name's Oscar Valdez, he was just busted for a banned substance that he was taking. Now, we all know that athletes don't take performance-enhancing drugs, right? Nobody does that. You know, and they're not good at not getting caught either, right? So think what you want about the fairness of sports. When there's millions of dollars on the line, people are going to cheat. And when I look at this, you know, my own personal feelings, if an article came out that the best players on, like the, my favorite player on the Cleveland Browns is Nick Chubb. If there was an article that came out that said Nick Chubb was busted for steroid use, my first reaction would be, no, you know, that, that can't be right. They must have messed the test up. Because that's just, that's what I want to believe. Right? So this Oscar Valdez on, on all the forums, the people that are either Mexican or most, for the most part, he can't generalize everybody, or fans of his said, no, 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 or they excused it. Well, the particular banned substance he used isn't for strength, it's for cutting weight. Well, what you're doing is that you got to get to a certain weight because it's not fair if you're way heavier than your opponent. It's just physics. There's a reason it's on the banned substance list. It gives you a, a, a an advantage over your opponent. So it goes from outright denial to making excuses that it wasn't that bad. Does that sound familiar? Do we, are there things we do that with ourselves or with Christian brothers and sisters or with the world? Well, it's not that bad, right? But if it's wrong, it's wrong. It's still a sin. You can't almost be sinning. Either you are or you aren't. And the joke that we talk about is you can't be almost pregnant, ladies. Either you are or you aren't. There's no almost. There's, 
the Bible gives us a clear defining line of sin. And guess what? We're all on the same side of that line. Because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The only man to live a sinless life was God in the flesh. There you go. There's the bar. So we're all on the same side on this one here, on this side of the issue. But to see, and you'll see this every day, whatever you want to find out, just listen to talk radio, turn on the news, the same event draws two different conclusions. The same set of circumstances draws two different conclusions. And it goes into every area of life, whether it's business. Um, Half of the stock market is being shorted by a group of people, half of it they want to buy it for the long term. Same set of data. Half of the people believe that, you know, this is the next great thing, invention. Half of the people think it's garbage and it's this other thing. We all carry our own sinful baggage, or our own perceptions of the world into every situation. So again, wouldn't it be nice if we had a clear, definitive answer on everything? <laughs> we do. But even then, we like to tap dance around God's word and make it fit our own perceptions or what we want it to be. And it's pretty neat. You'll see, you'll see children do this. And adults, if you're trained in psychology, is that when you ask somebody a question, you can do these subtle head movements to try to steer them your way. You ever talk to somebody, they're like, so do you want to go here with me? Subliminally, they're telling you, nod your head yes, right? Or uh, people do this, and police can pick this out too, in interrogation, people's body language. Your mouth can say one thing, but your soul or your heart says something else. And you're like, man, that's a good idea, isn't it? You know, just these subtle things and eye movements and, you know, your sins are going to find you out. But at the end of the day, that we carry our own presuppositions into everything and we want to believe things in, I guess, stark contrast to the evidence. So imagine, like in the book of Judges, when everybody can just do what they want in their own eyes that's right. And what happened in the book of Judges? Read it. Blow your mind. So we do need an absolute standard of right and wrong. We do need the truth in every circumstance because everything can get framed however you want it to be. And we have this brilliant ability as a people to ignore truth because it's inconvenient to us. It's not what we want to hear. It doesn't make us feel warm and fuzzy. Remember, the heart of every person is sinful and we need a savior and we need a perfect savior and that's what we got. And that's what we're going to celebrate today. But let's look at this real quick. Um, Matthew 26, we're going to start at verse 57. We'll go back to the, the text that Dan read. Matthew 26, 57 through 58. We're going to read the first couple of verses of this passage. It said, Then those who seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And I'm, I'm reading the ESV version here. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. So Jesus was arrested. Now we know as believers that everything that is happening here was according to God's will and plan. We can't overlook that. So God was not surprised by any of this, including Peter. So he was brought before the religious leaders of the time at the perfect time at the fullness of time. This is exactly what God wanted when he wanted it. So Jesus was not a victim here. And sometimes we forget that. And that makes his sacrifice that much more impressive. So Peter followed it basically as far as a distance as he could to see the action. Because he kind of wanted to see how this was going to play out. Now, again, Peter brought his own human baggage into this situation. So this is an apostle of Christ, one of the 12, one of the closest people to him while he was here on earth. And he had his own presuppositions that were based on the world. Not things of Christ, but things of the world. Now, was this unfair to Peter for us? Was he warned about any of this? Multiple times. Again, again, I'm just, I'm belaboring this point because I want us to understand that, you know, we may wake up and think we have it all figured out, But when you encounter the truth of Scripture, it should bring you to your knees. And what Peter didn't realize was that, I know in in the book of Matthew, I believe, there's three separate references where Jesus flat out foretells that this exact thing was going to happen. And you think the one time that would have stuck in Peter's head, or even any of our heads, because again, we can't think that we would have been any better than Peter, but when Jesus 
when Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, let's go back a few chapters in Matthew 16, and we're going to look at verses 21 through 23. So Matthew 16, 21 through 23, I'll give everybody a second there. Now this is Jesus, again, foretelling his death and resurrection. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. What a strong rebuke. Imagine Jesus looking you dead in the eyes and saying, Get behind me, Satan. That is what's called the spirit of the Antichrist things that are not of the mind of God and are not kingdom-focused, but are worldly-focused. So from a worldly standpoint, do you want your leader to be arrested and killed? No. I mean, that's common sense, right? But again, we serve a God that is greater than the world, that created the world, that has a plan that we might not even know what it is yet. But if our eyes are only focused on the world and not what the expressed direction of our Savior is, We're living out the spirit of the Antichrist, which is in direct opposition to the will of God. So you may be in a position like Peter where God has given you a task or set you aside for a specific purpose. And when you look at it against what the world would think, it's wrong or doesn't make sense. But it may take a few times for Jesus to look you in the eye or through the leading of the Holy Spirit to say, Get behind me, Satan, because you're thinking of worldly things and not of my things, of what I want. Because everything we do needs to follow the kingdom of God and not what our preconceived notions are. So Peter carried his human baggage right into there with him. After Jesus had told him at least three times, probably more, exactly what was going to happen, but he still didn't know or he didn't understand or he was scared and wanted to see how things were going to go. Could have been a lack of faith. You know, really when we sin or when we doubt God, that's what it always comes down to, is a lack of faith on our own hearts. So Peter got the cliff notes, he got the answers before the test, and he failed. And Jesus even told him, look, the rooster's going to crow three times and you're going to deny me. And Peter still did it. So it'd be amazing to be around Jesus. (laughs) Hey, you're going to do this, and it happens. And right up to it, you know, it's like when you say something you know you shouldn't say. And as it's leaving your mouth, you're trying to grasp at it to get it, but it's too late. I imagine Peter felt that times 10 after that rooster crowed and he looked at, Jesus looked at him and said, I told you so. But again, Peter had his mind set on what? The things of Christ? No, he was afraid of what people would think. So we all do it. We're no better than Peter. You know, this morning in Bob's class, there's a great contrast in the book of Romans where you know, Paul lists a, a, a group of sins that we would all look at and say, yeah, that's a bad person. But then starting the next chapter, it says, but you're doing this stuff right now yourselves. So we've got to remember that, that we're all, we're all sinners in need of a Savior, no matter what our station in life is. So moving on back to Matthew chapter 20, 26, let's keep going here. We're going to look at verses 59 through 61. It says, now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward at last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. So imagine being Jesus, knowing that you're willingly sacrificing your life for people that hate you. And, watch, and it doesn't say exactly how many or how long this parade of liars was, but people just lie after lie after lie. You know why none of it stuck? Because none of it was true. Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. You know, if someone could, like, watch you your whole life and you had to go up to trial, how much baggage would they have on you? They couldn't even make a lie stick. And the Bible tells us that to live in such a way that our enemies have nothing bad to say about us. Now, we're not going to be perfect. 
But isn't, isn't, that, isn't that amazing when you think about that? It took a parade of liars and no, not two people could corroborate the same thing. But you know what got Jesus? The truth. What did they say that was true? That they got two people to corroborate? I will destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. Absolutely true. You know what makes the world angry? It's not the lies about Jesus, it's the truth. The world wants Jesus to be, uh, you know, a lovable guy that is just as good as Muhammad and Buddha. That if he's a good guy and everybody's going to get to heaven anyway if you're a good person. Or that Jesus was a great moral teacher. And I believe it was C.S. Lewis that said, you cannot have that opinion of Jesus if you read anything about him. He wasn't some hippie guy living under the bridge and playing bongo drums with all the sinners. He went to them where they were at. He loved them enough to call them to repentance. Jesus did not say, you're good as you are. I love you anyway. He said, I love you anyway. Now go and sin no more. So no, and I, I see this all the time in forums when I'm reading about people talking about atheism, and they would say, you know, if Jesus were alive today, and that's almost a direct quote, I don't even know the guy that said it, but he said he would be hanging out with all the people that are sinners. Well, you're right, he would, but he'd be healing them and calling them to repentance. He would not be saying, you guys are good, and oh, okay, this guy Buddha's good too, let's all have a drum circle. That is not what the Savior of the world came to do, and it's not what he did. So the world wants that Jesus, the lie. The world rejects the truth of who Jesus is, which is the only way to get to heaven. There is no other way, there is no other path. It is through Christ alone. That, the truth about Christ, is what makes people furious. Am I off base? Okay. So what happens when the truth of Jesus is given in front of all these witnesses and in front of the religious leaders of the day? You remember, God can't lie. He's not a liar. So verse 62, and the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is this that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. This is verse 63. And then the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So again, the truth comes out. The person that doesn't want to hear it stands up, makes a spectacle, and is daring Jesus to admit who he is. What's Jesus say? Jesus said to him in verse 64, you have said so, but I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. There's your answer, high priest. Yes. You're the one that said it, by the way. And oh, by the way, you're, next time you see me, it's going to be in power and glory at the right hand of God. So how did this make the high priest feel? Did he say, oh, you're right. Okay, I get it. Mm -mm. What did he say? Verse 65, then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him and slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is that that struck you? So what made him come unhinged? Jesus is God. Made him unhinged. Blasphemer, blasphemer. You say something like that today, you're blaspheming against the world. And they treat it just as aggressively. How dare you say that you're a Christian, that everybody needs Jesus? How arrogant of you. You should live and let live, right? Why would you go all over the world? And we saw this, Paul and I saw this in a guy I grew up with in church, unfortunately. And he's, from what I can tell, has since left faith in Christ, or if he ever had it, to begin with. But he was agreeing with somebody saying that, oh, you know, missionaries are so arrogant. Live and let live. Who are you to tell them that they're right? See, the world hates the truth because the hearts of man are set against the things of God. We should not be surprised by any of this. It breaks our heart. 
and we wish it wasn't that way, but what finally got Jesus convicted, again, we know that he, he freely gave his life, what got him convicted was the truth about who he was and who he is, because he's still here. And that makes people so uncomfortable and so angry. And so you're going to encounter in your Christian walk people who are just furious at the truth of Scripture. Now, why did the chief priests and the scribes, why were they so angry with Jesus? Because the Bible's true and right, number one. But number two, it threatened their little power structure too. So there was an anger and there was a, you have something to fight against. When you hear people that are, that, that identify as atheist. They're the most confrontational, angry people you'll ever talk to because they're railing against something that in their heart they know is true. So if you are defying something or if you're pushing back on something, you're pretty passionate about it because you know the truth. And so somebody says, you know, the Bible tells us a fool said in his heart there is no God. And it's hilarious. If, if they're really antagonistic about the Bible, Whenever evidence comes up about the Bible to support the truth of Scripture, you know, people get angry about it, and they explain away, and they tap dance around it. So one of my favorite examples is how now that they're looking inside of dinosaur bones, they're finding red blood cells and tissue. Well, science says that after 100,000 years, that stuff's gone. Well, these things are only a couple thousand years old, and we know that from the truth of Scripture. So there's that one piece of evidence... Another piece of evidence is there's drawings of dinosaurs all over the world from the 1600s and earlier. We have paintings, tapestries, drawings, wood carvings, carvings in stone in Utah. There's carvings in a church floor in England. In China, why do you think on the Chinese zodiac there's a dragon? It's a dinosaur. And there, on the wall of a temple in Cambodia, in Angkor Wat, near there, there's a carving of a triceratops that looks perfect. Verified, hundreds of years old, nobody tampered with it. Because, brothers and sisters, people saw these things. I hate to blow your mind, but the truth of Scripture is the truth of Scripture. God made the animals on the same day. People walked with these things. Why do you think there's all these dragon epics in, in old literature? Gilgamesh, you know, basically talking about a T-Rex. Socrates, I think it was Socrates or Aristotle, wrote about pterodactyls and the fig trees in the Middle East. Giant winged reptiles that annoyed the farmers. In the face of what is obvious and what we know to be true, people that carry their human baggage into a situation will try to tap dance around it and explain it away. So a scientist who's supposed to be purely empirical, I look at the evidence and that's what frames my way of thinking, they see bones that are thousands of years old based on the rate of decay and the, the blood cells and tissue that are in them. So they don't change their presupposition that dinosaurs are younger than what they thought they were. They say, well, there must be a reason that this stuff didn't decay. Right? Because they have an axe to grind. And we as sinful people, we have an axe to grind about everything, it seems like, anymore. So in the face of what we know to be right and true, we say, no, I know this is fact, but I'm going to find a way to explain around it. Now, I'm not trying to paint a grim picture about salvation here. We're going to get to what's important here in a little bit. But I'm just trying to drive the point home that we think we can argue someone into heaven. You can't do it. We think we can prove somebody wrong with facts. You can't do it because it's not a factual issue, it's a spiritual issue. We are spiritual beings, brothers and sisters. So, the people freaked out. In the face of persecution, Jesus' restraint was just amazing. So, you are going to come into your Christian life with the world with people that are openly hostile to you. They want to take you out. They want nothing to do, to do with you. Now, that's not every encounter you're going to have. And let's look at what happens with Jesus next after this. Open opposition, the truth, sets them off. They cannot handle the truth of Scripture. Let's look at another type of person that we're going to run into. And this is a gentleman named Pilate. So we're going to be in the book of Matthew. Let's turn to chapter 27. We're going to look at verses 11 through 14. Matthew 27, 11 through 14. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked of him, Are you the king of the Jews? Which they were proclaiming that he was, or saying that's the reason they're handing him over. Jesus said, You've said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? 
Verse 14, but he gave him no answer, not even a single to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Why do you think Jesus did this? People were lying about him, saying things that weren't true. The one thing that got him busted was true. Well, Jesus also, during his ministry, fulfilled prophecy. And Isaiah chapter 53, we're going to turn to, basically the messianic prophecy in Isaiah. Many Orthodox Jewish schools will not allow anybody to read from this chapter. So, and it's in the Old Testament too. It's not the New Testament, but it is forbidden to be studied or learned about. Why do you think that is? Because our hearts are set against the truth. So Isaiah 53. And we're going to look at verses 4 through 7. Isaiah 53, 4 through 7. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the chastisement that was brought to, I'm sorry, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. That was a direct fulfillment of a written prophecy hundreds of years before this. And in the, the providence and the sovereignty of God, sometimes he leaves us a trail of breadcrumbs. Now we know we have the written word of God. But also this Bible, this book, has been proven out over 2,000 years to be dead on. People have tried for 2,000 years to, dis to discredit this book and the canonization and the process and how it was put together, they can't do it. It's still here. We're, we're promised that the word of God is going to outlive everything. So we don't need to worry about all of a sudden someday learning that this is just a bunch of fairy tales. Because it's not. And it's always proven right all throughout history. So in this case here, and we're going to talk about our friend Pilate. Many times in life, you're going to encounter people that have that outright rejection and hostility toward the scripture. But then there's also a fear-based avoidance of the truth. You don't have to take, plant your flag on any one situation. A lot of times, people kind of straddle the middle. And that's where all this, this uh, I like to call it nonsense, because it is, the saying that you live out your truth. There's no such thing as your truth. It's either the truth or it's not right? There is no your truth. It is the truth or what's not the truth. Now, there are some things that are not an issue that even garners anything like that. Like, what's the best hamburger around? You know, we're not talking about that kind of stuff. You may have your own opinion, and you may, uh, that may be a hill that you would want to die on. Um, so it's not like, what's your favorite restaurant? Who's the best basketball player of all time? We're talking about real eternal things. And there is always a truth. And there, you're either going to be on the side of Jesus or, it's, or you're not. But fear-based avoidance is kind of where our friend Pilate comes in. Jesus first encountered the people that were hostile and wanted him gone. Now he's encountering somebody that has Jesus with him and does not know what to do. And he is scared to death. So let's look at this guy. Maybe you can identify someone like this in your life or maybe you are or have been this person. But in Matthew chapter 27... 15 through 23. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had them a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when, they had, get, when he, they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? So I think Pilate was trying to stack the deck here a little bit. It's kind of like choice A or choice B. You know, this is the obvious one. Like, do you want one chocolate bar or do you want like the 10 pound king size one as a kid? You know, which one are you gonna pick? So he said, well, here's this 
Barabbas guy, which, you know, he's really awful, or this Jesus the Christ guy? Who should I release? Thinking that, okay, it's common sense that this man can't even find anything wrong with him. Wouldn't the population rather have him? Au contraire. And we know the reason why, but no, they said, give us Barabbas. Give us the troublemaker. You know, we, we hate Jesus more than we're afraid of Barabbas being back in the general population. And why did he do this? Verse 18, for he knew that it was out of the envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I've suffered much because of him today in a dream. So his wife was begging him, saying, look, honey, don't mess with this man. And I'm sure that every time he sat at the judgment seat, his wife wasn't slipping him text messages or notes. Okay, this was really serious, that she was suffering about this man named Jesus in a dream. So he had the knowledge that he knew this man was innocent, and he had the knowledge that his wife is telling him, confirming his beliefs, don't mess with Jesus, this is a good man. So what's he do? Verse 20 Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you guys want me to release? Like, okay, you got one more shot. This crazy animal here, Barabbas, or Jesus, who I can't even find anything wrong with. And they said to him, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? Again, this is, he's given him like three chances here. Like, why do you want this man eliminated? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So the world will do that, won't they? Everything is okay but Jesus. We would rather have things that we know are wrong or twisted or evil instead of being jealous or envious or being convicted that we know that there is a right and a wrong. There is Jesus who has died for everyone. We would rather have our filth and sit in it. Every day that we reject Jesus Christ, we're asking for Barabbas to be let go. Right? Like we, we'd rather play in that box there, in that sandbox that needs cleaned out, than have the freedom and, and love and, and trust and hope of salvation through Christ Jesus. We're more comfortable in our sinful nature. Now what does Pilate do? So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Boy, I bet they wish they could take that one back. What happened in about, you know, Not that long after that, Jerusalem was destroyed. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. See, the Jews couldn't do this without the buy-in of the Roman government, because they were really an occupied territory at that time. So the Jews had their whole crucifixion that they would have, they couldn't crucify him, so they needed the Romans to be the bad guys, but then they couldn't also just push him on Jesus on the Romans, the Romans had to, to authorize it. So there's this whole song and dance here that everybody's trying to pawn off their dirty work on somebody else. And that's exactly what happened here. So Pilate, knowing the crowd was jealous, knowing that his wife warned him, don't mess with him, he washed his hands of Jesus and he gave in to the mob. Now all throughout scripture in the Old Testament, I was doing some research and there were some commentaries that I saw that you know, there's some ritual hand washing out through the Old Testament And so Pilate knew that that symbolic hand washing of saying, look, I'm clean, that the Jewish scholars probably would have gotten that, that he's telling them, look, his blood's on you. I disagree with you, but for my fear of the angry mob, I'm going to let bad things happen. I'm going to let an innocent man die. Boy, how many good people know what to do and don't do it because they're afraid of the mob? So you may not be openly hostile towards Jesus, but for fear of retribution, or being ridiculed, or losing your job, or what we call in social media, it's cancel culture. If you speak out against something that the big people in tech can delete your account, people will literally stalk you. 
put your picture on the internet. People will bully you with their phone and their device if you stand up for Jesus. So maybe you're not openly antagonistic toward Christ, but maybe you're afraid more what the world thinks than what Jesus thinks. What does the Bible say in the book of Revelation about churches that carry that stance? I will spew you out of my mouth. I'd rather you be either hot or cold. So if we as a congregation, I'm not saying that we do this, but what I really want to drive home here is that we cannot allow the world to dictate our theology. We cannot allow the trappings of the world and the fear of being called mean people to dictate our doctrinal stances. And we cannot allow the fear of what popular culture will say about us to dictate our ministries. We have the absolute written word of God as truth. And these are things that we can never lay down at the feet of the the angry mob and the angry hordes out of fear. We may lose our 501c3 status as a church. We may lose face in the pop and you know in the public view. But if it's for the cause of Christ, that's all that matters. We should not care what the world thinks. We should only care what God thinks. Let's look at 1 John, and then um, we'll kind of start to prepare our hearts and minds for communion. But let's look at 1 John, chapter 2. And we're going to go verses 23 through 25. So 1 John 2, 23 through 25. We'll get our hearts ready, and I I believe Pastor Eric's going to administer the emblems here for communion. 23 through 25 of 1 John chapter 2. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will be able to abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you, but his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and, and, and is no lie. Just as it has taught you, abide in him. You cannot deny Christ and claim to be a child of God. So we can't play both sides of the fence. We can't be lukewarm. We can't be a group of people that gets together and just celebrates this guy named Jesus. Maybe he was real, maybe he wasn't. Maybe the accounts of the Bible and in Genesis are real, maybe they're not. Uh, Maybe other people are okay too, but we're all just different people trying to get to the same place. The truth of scripture and the truth since the beginning of time is that you were created in God's image. He knew who you were before time began. He loves you and he died for you. And the simple truth is that apart from a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you are eternally separated from God in hell. And that's the truth of the gospel. Now the beauty of the gospel is what we're going to celebrate today is that Jesus kept his mouth quiet allowed himself to be arrested, knew that his closest people were going to betray him, knew that he was going to get spit on and slapped in the face, and he had you in mind the whole time, and he did it anyway, because he knew that apart from him, we could not approach God in eternity. We couldn't spend eternity with heaven, in heaven with God. So the truth of the salvation is that because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we can be saved. Apart from him, we cannot be. And when we talk about all these things like you know, maybe you are somebody that was antagonistic against Christ. Maybe you're somebody that's been lukewarm. Well, because the Bible is always right and it tells us that we all have a sinful nature, the only way to come to God is through the miracle and the gift of salvation through the Holy Spirit. So don't beat yourselves up. I know I, I, I had a big setup here to tell you, don't beat yourselves up, accept the free gift of salvation and the Holy Spirit will change your heart. He will give you strength. He will give you the ability to stand up for Christ in the face of opposition. He will truly change your heart and renew your mind. And again, brothers and sisters, this is a gift of love. If you love somebody, you don't watch them stumble into a pit, do you? So if we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to remind them of the truth of Scripture and encourage them not to let the world pull them away from God. But we also need to love those who are living in sin enough to let them know that there's a better way. And I'm not even talking about here on earth. You may lose everything for the cause of Christ here. 
but we don't want Jesus to look at us and say, get behind me, Satan, because your mind is on the world and not of my kingdom. So praise the Lord that he is long-suffering. I used to love that word as a kid. He is long-suffering. He is patient. He gives us grace that renews every day. And he died once for everybody. So the communion that we're going to celebrate today is not a recreation of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. It's a reminder of his willing sacrifice that was so powerful and amazing, it was one time for all of humanity. So praise the Lord for that. And um, I don't know, Pastor Eric, did you want to take it from here? Thank you, John. What a good reminder that we need to abide in Christ. And there's a reality that the truth of Jesus will cause the world to hate us, right? Uh, that's been true throughout history, and nothing has changed today. Uh, in fact, I think we can see it you know, more so today than we probably ever have been able to for quite a while. So at this time, I'm going to invite the elders to come forward. Um, and while they're doing that, I just want to get our minds a little bit towards communion. And, you know, when I was a kid, I, I went to church. And I really didn't have any idea what communion was about, to be honest. I mean, I knew a little bit, but I liked communion because I was always thirsty by the end of the service, and at least I got a little bit of juice to tide me over. So uh, obviously that's not why we come together. Um, and, and so with that, I just want to want to say this from, from 1 Corinthians 11. Why do we do communion? Why do we do this thing where we eat this bread and drink this cup? And the reality is we do this, according to Scripture, by proclaiming the Lord's death. Proclaiming the death of Jesus Christ. But not just proclaiming the death, we're proclaiming the significance of that death on our own life. The reality of what John just reminded us of, that Jesus died and suffered on our behalf so that we no longer have to suffer. Right? So we can have eternity in the presence of God. That's why we come to this table this morning. And this table, just as a way of reminder, is something we do as believers, as fellow believers in Christ. You don't have to be a member of Kingsway Alliance Church, but what you need to be is a follower of Jesus. Scripture is very clear about that. This is something we do to, uh, to represent our bond, our unity with Christ through his death and resurrection. So as we come to the table, I want to invite you each and every one of you, as the, as the elders here are passing the cup, um, Patty's going to be playing on the piano, piano, sorry, and I just invite you to examine your own hearts and your own lives. We're warned in scripture not to take the cup in an unworthy manner. If there's something in your life, some besetting sin, uh, some sort of grievance against another brother or sister in the Lord, I encourage you, don't take the communion cup or the bread without first dealing with that in your own heart and life. So at this time, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to have the, the brothers here pass the, the elements. And you just have a few moments uh, to reflect on your own heart, and uh, then I'll give us some further instruction. Lord God, we do praise you for you are good. And Lord, I, I thank you that even though the world may hate you, may despise you, may hate us on your account, Lord, I praise you that you have rescued us out of our life of sin, that you have made a way when there was no other way for us to be saved. And we're here this morning taking part of this communion, these communion elements to represent that, Lord, to, to, to demonstrate our trust in you as our Savior through your death and resurrection. So I pray that you would help for us to do this in a manner that is worthy uh, of and that we would examine our hearts and lives as we do this this morning in Jesus name amen